May I express my deep joy being your guest for these days. We came conditionally. <clears throat> if the Lord had been pleased to do what only the Lord can do, why, I, I've kept my vow. He's not done that. I'm going to keep on serving him the best I know how, and I know you are. But it's been a rich blessing <clears throat> to me to be here. I felt like I'm among friends. Most of my ministers have been in enemy territory, and I thank God for that. I can't preach good till I get everybody about three fourths mad at me, and they tell me what I preach ain't so. But you've been such a wonderful. I've been able to find one thing wrong with you. I think I told you about that the other night, and, and you've cured that, I'm sure. But that's exceptional. Thank you so much for this delightful privilege. It's been my privilege to be for a few days in many, many congregations. Then to come to the last service, say goodbye. And for many of them, that was goodbye until we see each other on the other side. I hope our paths shall cross again. I venture to hope that. And I've come to love your museum view preacher. He's stubborn. I've tried to convert him, but he just won't. Get and uh, we've had a glorious time. Fall in love with his family, and uh, the reason the missus sings good because she's born in August. We were out the other day, one of the few days it was warm, the sun shone up here in Yankee Land, and the pastor had a flat tire, and he pulled off the side of the road, got out. I got out. Every job needs a foreman, and I acted as foreman for the job of changing the tires. And it was a little warm. I gave him what advice I could. He did the work, and he got to perspiring, and he reached in his hip pocket, pulled out an old red bandana handkerchief like we have out in Texas, mopped his brow. And as he pulled his handkerchief out of his pocket, something fell out to the ground. And he reached down very quickly, I noticed, and picked whatever it was up and put it back in his pocket. He didn't want me to see it. But I'm curious, and I began to pester him to tell me what it was. He didn't want me to see. And he just wouldn't. I just kept pestering and finally said that. If I wouldn't tell anybody about it, he'd tell me. <laughs> I gave him my promise. I wish I hadn't, so I could tell you. <laughs> I can't tell it now. If I hadn't given him the promise, I could tell you, of course, I can't, because I did promise him, but if I hadn't promised him, I could tell you it was his wife's teeth. <laughs> he said he'd had so many medical bills, times were hard. He said he caught his wife eating between meals, so he carried the teeth along with him so she couldn't eat between meals. It's been good to be here. Appreciate it very much. Now will you open the word of God to the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms at chapter 14. Psalms 14. I want to do a thing that ordinarily carries with it a great deal of danger tonight, but I want to say a word in connection with the message about how God saved an infidel, a word of personal testimony that's dangerous because when one gives his testimony, he usually tells stories about it. The other is that no two Christians will ever have the same experience. 
And uh, anybody that trusts his experience, that's awful good sign you've missed Christ. Experience is wonderful, but experience doesn't save. It's Christ that saves. But I want just a word in the message, leading up to the word of testimony about how God saved an infidel, to say a word about my own experience. My scripture tonight is found in Psalms 14, the first sentence in that first verse. You have your pencils and you have an authorized King James Version before you. You'll notice there are two words in that sentence in italics. That means they ought not to be there. That the translators thought by the addition of these words that they would help the meaning. But yeah, if you read it like it is in the Bible that I have before me, it's silly. Let me read it like it is, and you'll immediately see how silly this statement is. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Now, if that's so, every other verse in the Bible will have to do away with it. If there has ever lived a human being, let me repeat it, if there has ever lived or ever shall live a human being, a member of Adam's race, that ever has been or ever shall be such a person who does not know that there is a God, why, then you've defeated the Bible. There are two things that every human being is born with. God gives you a knowledge that he is God, and he gives you knowledge of the right and wrong. Now, those things God just gives to people. I don't know about animals, but if you're a human being, it's silly go around saying there is no God. There is no God. You know, we got some things in the slang of the street working for us. One is the God consciousness on the part of all mankind. Men know there's a God. And then there's a knowledge of right and wrong. And all men have it. It gets keener or it dies out, but to have it. And men may sin against their God consciousness to the extent they'll take their knives and build gods for themselves. But all men start out with these two gifts from God. But if you rub out those two words in italics, there is. They ought not to be there, and here they do not add to the meaning take it away. And you read this verse, the fool has said in his heart, he won't even say it in his mind, he's got too much sense even though he's a fool to say in his mind, but he will say in his heart that part of a person that makes him tick, that makes him what he is, his emotions and his thinking. The fool has said in his heart, no God for me. No God for me. I know there's a God, but not for me. He'll not tell me to do this. And he'll not tell me don't do this. He'll not prohibit me from doing this. The fool in God's eyes is the man who lives in God's world. 
says the owner and the ruler and the governor of the world I live in shall not dictate to me no God for me. The fool, the fool has said in his heart, no God for me. If you remember the human race who were born, was that in your heart? You were born a rebel. The one sure way, the one sure way to bring your nature, who you are, what makes you tick or myself out into the open is to cross you, cross your will, cross your desire, cross your thinking, across your custom, across your tradition. And you'll strike out like a rattlesnake because you are a rebel. If you want to be dead sure your children do something, just tell them they can't. Tell right You heard that about the closet. Don't open the closet. <laughs> now that just tell them and they'll open it. Come hell or high water. Why? It's born that way. It's born that way. Why is the law such a terrible thing? Because we were born in rebellion against God's truth. All God has to do is to tell us, don't you do that? And we'll do it. Hell freezes over. Or to tell us to do something. And if there's one thing we determine not to do, it's what he tells us to do. Why? We're born that way. We're born that way. And the Bible tells us, I do not understand it, it just tells us that when Adam sinned, we sin, all sin. All sin. Everybody said, oh yes, I know I sin. But the Bible says, yonder in the Garden of Eden, I sin. And when Adam sought to drag God down off his throne, and sit there himself, the Bible says, I, I did that. I did that. We're born rebels. There's one thing that is this Bible it says one thing to see. It says this one thing from every different direction. The rebellion in the hearts of people is going to be crushed. The rebellion is going to be crushed. There isn't a doubt on earth. That is the one message of this Sometimes I get under the juniper tree. Who doesn't? If you're human. I don't know it's something to brag about. Say, well, I never worry. I love to see a certain intent. So a little like the Apostle Paul, who carried around with him. Great heaviness and continual sorrow. He never got a whistle. He never got a whistle. I wish we, being weak as we are, that sometimes, sometimes, our weakness would show up trying to 
carry burdens that we better put on his shoulders. As long as we're weak, I like to see people that don't just laugh too much while you live in a world that fits at the crown rights of the Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes it gets a little blue. Inevitably, I'll turn to the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, and I'll read, He must reign. Come hell or high water, He must reign. I think He's reigning now. Amen. And I think he's going to keep on reigning until this world is brought back under the sovereign rule. And when he's got a world that rejected the Savior, bowing at his feet, he's going to turn that subject world back over to the Father that the Godhead may be all in all. I don't know whether I'm smart enough to understand all that or not, but I think I've got sense enough to know it says the Lord's going to keep on the job until it's done. And the last enemy he's going to destroy is death. And I think he's going to keep on doing what he's doing now until his enemies that made his footstool and the last one will be dead. And although I don't know how to work out the charge and the details of how it come into pass. Hallelujah, thine the glory, the rebellion that started in the Garden of Eden when all the world was there. Thank God it's going to be crushed. The rebellion's going to be crushed. God Almighty has two ways of crushing rebellion. One day, he's going to put his foot on the neck of the enemy, the Scripture says. One day, he's going to bear his arm by his outfit power. Bring all his enemies to his now, he makes friends out of enemies by persuasion. So much better to become a friend of the Lord by his wooing, by his persuasion. And to have to wait until by his power he puts down the rebellion. The story is told of the king. The rebellion broke out amongst his subjects, called out the army and went and put down the rebellion, crushed it. Some of the rebellious subjects Instead of throwing down their arms and coming under the sovereign rule of their sovereign, they fled to the swamps and the mountain fastnesses, kept their weapons, hiding out from the king. 
And the king caused the giant candle to be erected up in the topmost part of the castle where it could be seen far and wide. Caused the candle to be lighted. And then he sent his messengers throughout the reaches of his kingdom, up and down the mountain fastnesses and wading through the swamps, crying out from the throne the message to all his subjects who were still in rebellion, that all of them who would come out of their hiding places bring their weapons of warfare and lay them at the feet of the king, that he give them a pardon and restore them to his table. Yonder at Calvary, the rebellion, thank God, was crushed. I know how things are going to wind up, brother. When I studied algebra in school, I didn't know the answer. We got a key, and you could look and get the answer, and the answer would have to work it. That it wasn't exactly cricket, I understand. But I know how everything's going to wind up. I looked in the back of the book. That's God. One day, one day, every rebel hiding from God. With a shotgun, poised, and with his life guarded in the no trespass sign, saying, We will not have this man to reign over us one day. Every last one of them will have to go down the arm, bow to the king. That's the answer. The rebellion is going to be crushed. And the grace of God is nothing more or less than while that candle burns. How long? I don't know. While the throne of God is inhabited by the Son of God. Nor until he leaves that throne to come back to this earth will that throne be a throne of judgment. Now it's a throne of mercy and a throne of grace. And the vilest sinner that ever arrived and wriggled his way on the hill is commanded and invited to throw his shotgun down, cease his rebellion, and come under the King Jesus. That's grace. That's grace. How does God save a man? God saves a man by crossing his will at the point where his rebellion heads up. How does God save a man? Let me repeat. He saves a man by confronting him by arresting him, by crossing his path and crushing him at the point where his rebellion heads up. We're told that God Almighty will not violate your will, but unless he breaks it, you'll just have to go to hell. God crosses men. He stands there and opposes and attacks until he breaks through and breaks through the rebellious will of 
a man. He always crosses him at the point where his rebellion heads up. What do you mean by that, preacher? The scriptures say if a man offend the law in one point, he's guilty of all. What does that mean? It simply means I think this. There are two things that I can see with all assurance that I'm telling the truth for one time. If I speak tonight to men and women who are yet on your road to hell, and there are just one or two reasons why there'd be anybody here tonight still on the road to hell. One is you've never, you've never heard of God's pardon or the other, there's a sore spot. There's a rotten spot somewhere in your life. And you're willing to be saved from hell, but thus far you've had a no trespass time somewhere. No, this is allowed, especially God. And if you're not careful, you're going to guard that rotten spot in your experience until the day will come when you'll sign a treaty of peace with it. And then when you seal your soul for damnation, Men and women usually anywhere in fitting distance of the influence of the gospel do not wish to go to hell. And they are somewhat anxious to be saved from hell. But they are determined that that one thing that has become their God, it may be a ten-cent thing, but the same thing as in David's experience every time he saw two men on the telephone pole talking, he just knew they were talking about him. His sin was ever before And men and women, their rebellion against the rule of God's Christ heads up in one place and you're willing to be saved from everything except that. And every time the Spirit of God takes truth and confesses you with it, that one thing looms as large as the heaven, and you stand guard over it. I've seen men and women under God under such deep conviction. I've seen them have to be carried out of my services and stretch. And yet they hold on. They guard that one darling thing. That's where the rebellion's headed up. That's what's going to send you to hell. And tell me about your piosity and your church relationship and all the nice things you do. I don't know about that, but I'm saying... There's one part there that there's no trespass sign on. You know nothing about the rule of Jesus Christ in your life. If that won't keep you repenting every day, I'll choose up and say, sir. I believe in order to get saved, a man's got to sign his life away to King Jesus. And I believe the reason you split hell wide open is there's something in your life 
that Jesus Christ is not allowed to touch. Anything except this. Anything. We're so constituted. My arm hurts terribly tonight. Seems like my whole body jumped up here where I was vaccinated the other day. See that poison or whatever it is that put in me to counteract the poison. It's headed up. Hurts. And men's poisonous rebellion always comes to a head. I will not throw this down. You're not going to go to hell because you're dumb. You're not going to go to hell because you're an ignoramus. You're going to go to hell because of all your might and name you stand guard. At some spot, and you've got a sign there, Keep off! It's amazing how funny sometimes a man's rebellion will show itself. Mr. Finney told a story the days when God's power is on him, especially up in the state of New York. He uh, was holding a meeting in a little town. The squire, I guess he'd be the county judge or something, Today, I don't know, the squire of the village. He listened to Mr. Finney preach, and every night after Mr. Finney preach, he'd say, he'd say, if you're interested in your soul, the place of prayer is over there in a certain, they built a sort of a brush harbor out there. And after the service, anybody interested in right with God, he invited him to go over there, and he'd be there as soon as he'd come. They'd pray and counsel together. And the old squire got under pretty deep conviction. He didn't want to go to hell. But he said, now, fella, don't have to go over there to that place to be saved. And he said, I want to be saved, but I'm not going to go over there. Well, of course, he is right. A fella doesn't have to do that. But where he was wrong is... <clears throat> that he told God something he wasn't going to do. That day. Of course, just as sure as you do it, you'll do what you said you ain't going to do, or you'll split hell wide open. And so the old squire, he determined he's going to get saved, but he wasn't going to go with that. Man didn't have to go to that place to be saved. He'd listen to the Senate preach. Instead of going over to that place to set aside for prayer, he'd go home. He'd get out in the room. He'd just pray up a storm. Nothing take place. He'd go back and hear Mr. Fenny. He'd go back to his room and pray, and nothing take place. One day it came a terrible rain and created a big old mud puddle right in front of the old squire's house. He had determined to show God how humble he was and how much he wanted to be saved. And he went from the meeting right back to that mud hole, right, right down in the middle of it. Got down on his knees, right in the mud, right in front of his house, just praying up a storm. And directly he got up out of the mud and went to the place he said he wouldn't go to. And God met him. You just can't tell God you won't do something. Because you're telling God what you... He, he crossed you right there. A man in New Orleans said, I'll never walk an hour. That I want to be saved, but I will not walk that hour. And I said, you, you played it now, brother. You fixed it so you'll split hell wide open, or you'll walk that out. Sometimes in little things, people's rebellion 
head there. I was in the coal mine section of West Virginia. And the owner of one of the big mines, a wealthy man, had me out to his home. He tell me his story. He said, Preacher, made five professions of faith. Then what's called baptized five times. It hadn't worked a single time. He said, I want to be saved. But he said, I told God I'd never walk another aisle. And I said, Well, goodbye, brother. And I got up and I said, you get my hat, I want to leave. He said, what's your hurry? I said, I'm scared to hang around here. I want to leave. I'm afraid God's going to kill you and send you to hell right now. And I don't want this fire to scorch me. He said, where are you buried? I said, you told God something you would not do. And you'll do it or you'll go to hell. I was right. I was right. Your rebellion heads up one place. I suppose there have never been two individuals who had identical experiences, but God had to break you by making you do what you said you would not do. You crossed your will. At the point where your shotgun was pointed toward his will. Said when? Said salvation me in there. And it be fixed up so that the will of God was what makes you tick. Said when is a man saved? Not running hot after the will of God for his life. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth his will. And it takes a miracle to fix it so you can. As in the state of Illinois, one Sunday morning, Stepmother, two beautiful stepdaughters. She'd been trying to get them to the meetings all during the meeting, but they had other fish to fry. As I came for the morning service, she waylaid me. And her heart was in her throat. She said, Brother Preacher, my daughters are here this morning. And she said, I'm going to be praying. While you preach. And I preached, and that's why I was stood with the invitation. The older of the daughters began to sob. Came running down to the front. That's why she claimed that the work was done. And then, after she said a word of testimony, kept on standing and singing. She went back to her seat. I stood there beside her sister, and I saw her put her arm around the sister. I don't know what she said, but you can kind of imagine. We kept on singing, and directly that stepmother, she couldn't, couldn't help it. And she moved over and stood on the other side. And the two of them were talking to that girl. And directly, the stepmother and the sister who recently said, the Lord saved her, they began to motion at me. I tried to ignore it, but they kept on. They wouldn't take no one. Directly, I asked, fast you run it. And I went back. I confronted the girl. By that time, she's weeping tears, the unsaved girl. And I hemmed and hauled around a little bit. The mother and the daughter wouldn't let me. I had to say something. And I began to try to say something. And the minute she looked me in the face and said, You need to talk to me. I want to be saved. I don't want to go to hell. 
But she said, I can't be saved. And I said, why can't you, Bishop? She said, if I got saved, I'd have to give up the dance. I said, you would? She said, yes. I said, somebody tell you that? She said, no. I said, I say anything about it in the sermon? She said, no. But she said, if I got saved, I'd have to give up the dance. I know what she would have or not. You can wrestle on that. But since she'd made that the point of issue, she was right. She was right. I talked with her a little while, and directly she looked at me, and by this time her face was changed. And she said, Preacher, hell or no hell, I'm not going to give up the dance. I was back traveling in Illinois, and it was so that I was going to pass through that town a year, two, three years later, about three years later, and I wrote to pastors with the passing through, and if he's home, we'd say hi to him. And when we got to his home, a good number of people were there to greet us, and they had the inevitable coffee and cake of you Yankees and and we had a time of fellowship and directly a beautiful girl with a little baby in her arms came up and said, Brother Barnard, you remember me? And I said, yes, I do. We had a little time. And then that's why the stepmother came up and I remembered her and with this. And I said, how is it with the other girl? She said, she's in hell. She made an issue of a little thing, and she held on, and she won the battle and gained hell. I was in Detroit, Michigan, and one night a Christian woman was standing at the front door as the people went out, and a young lady, about 18 years old, <clears throat> The Christian woman said, Dear one, we're so glad to have you. Hope you'll be back tonight. Oh, she said, I can't come back tonight. And the worker said, Why not? She said, I got to go to the picture show tonight. And the worker said, Do you have to go? Yes, I promise. Won't you come back tonight and hear the gospel? No, I can't. I'm going to the picture show tonight. And the worker told me about it. And that night in preaching, I just mentioned it. I never dreamed I'd get in trouble. I thought the young girl was in the picture. I just assumed she was. I knew she was. And I referred to the blind of a person like that. She was trembling as that worker talked. And they had baptismal service. That happened to be the last night of the meeting. And after I'd finished preaching, they turned the lights off. The pastor was baptized. And some I was sitting down at the front. And while the lights were off, the pastor was baptizing. Somebody slipped up and sat down behind me and touched me on my shoulder. I looked around and I saw a good deal of hatred in the young lady's eyes. I said, understand I'm blind. I said, who are you? I'm the girl you talked about. I said, I thought you was the picture show. She said, no, I'm here. I said, I'm no more blind than you are. I said, yes, you are. Somebody make the choice you make blind. Blind to that. Directly the lights were on. And I thought that was the end of that. And the people were coming to tell me goodbye. And I looked around and there's that girl. She wouldn't go home. She waited till the crowd thinned out. She came up. She won't talk about it. She said, Preacher, you think there's anything wrong with going to take show? I said, What do you think about it? Well, she said, that If I got saved, would I have to give up the picture show? I said, Yeah, since you made it a point of conflict. Ladies and gentlemen, this scares this preacher. I don't care how little it is. For God's sake, don't get in a controversy with God Almighty. Tell him what you won't do. 
for what you won't give up. He'll cross you there and crush you, or you'll go to hell. With me, I was kept out of the kingdom of God for many years. Because my rebellion headed up in the matter of being a preacher. You can have a good thing or a ten cent thing. But every time the issues of time and eternity were brought face to face with me, all of my strength. Summoned everything to resist and hold on. For I knew that to say an eternal yes to the crown rights of King Jesus meant for me to be a preacher. And I didn't want to be one. I knew I was going to have to preach. I knew it. Before I was born, I didn't know this until after the Lord saved me. But before I was born, I'm glad I'm older than most of you. My mother and father gave me to the Lord to be a preacher. Before I was born, people used to do that, you know. They never told me. They knew about it. The Lord knew about it. They never told me. Never one word. Anybody ever tell me about it? When I was 11 years old, one year after I'd made a profession of faith and been baptized, what did you do when you're not saved but you go through the motions? I was as honest as I could be, didn't know what it was all about. When I was 10, when I was 11 years old, a missionary came to our town. They gave what they used to call calling out the call. They stood up and sang, I'll go where you want me to go, dear Lord. I'll be what you want me to be. He gave a call, anybody? He gave a call to anybody? That'll make a vow tonight. Go anywhere the Lord wants you to go and say anything he wants you to say and so forth. For I knew it. Yeah, I was. I said, I will. I meant it. I didn't know the significance. You see what you give to God. He never will let you swap back. He never will. You say, I forget it, but he don't. He don't. I went away to college at an early age and found out I wasn't a Christian. How you find out you're not a Christian? Nothing in here to help you resist temptation. And live for the Lord. All the devil had to do was just sort of crook his finger. No power. Divine power. For four years I wouldn't darken the door of anybody's church. I couldn't stand it. I hear a fella preach for then. I said, I wish you'd sit down and let me up there. I could preach pretty good in those days. You know, a man's got to have some peace. A man's got to have something to help him so he can sleep at night. And I was in mortal hell. So I decided I was an infidel. And I got a lot of kick out of it. 
an infidel, you spell it I-N-F-O-R-H-E-L-L, infidel. An infidel is the man of my text, the fool has said in his heart, no God for me. How do you say God can't tell me what to do? Just book him when his will is pressing on you. I won't do it. I won't do it. And no America's full of professing Christians in rebellion against God. But I don't want to be in their shoes. I say, well, I know we'll have to wait the next life to be perfect. The difference in not being perfect and having your shotgun pointed at the heart of God's will for your life. And I, I had to have some peace. Godless Father in it forever. I've yet to meet the first human being. To me, come in spitting distance of the Christian character of my day. Godly mother. Reared in church. Educated in Christian college. I had to have something. So I decided I was an infidel. And I organized a club. And spent my senior year in college as the president of that club, making fun of God. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd make fun of God during the daytime, but never a night. I wouldn't get out on my knees before I'd go to sleep. I was scared. And when night come, my uh, infidelity would sort of slip away. And I'd say, Lord, if you let me live till tomorrow, I'll surrender. Because tomorrow never comes, you know. Oh, the tell Brother Barnum, all you gotta do is get out on your knees and ask God to save you and He'll forgive you and He'll save you. But I did it for every night for four long years. But at the same time I was praying, I was holding on to one thing. I ain't gonna pray. I ain't gonna pray. You can't get nowhere doing that. I graduated and went off to the Panhandle of Texas to teach school. Well, in those days, you had to be a church member to teach in a public school. Not in law by, but just had to. And I was a member in good standing of a Baptist church. Sure, I hadn't darkened the door in four years. It's right on the campus. I was the known president of an infidel's club, but I still a member of the church, whatever that is. And so when I went to teach school, first Sunday morning, I walked down the aisle and shined the church by a letter. Had to. I didn't want to lose my job. Well, of course, I didn't show up that night. And Wednesday night, of course I wasn't there. And Wednesday night, they had a business meeting and elected me teacher of the men Bible class. Well, I had to take it. Couldn't afford not to. And if I didn't get in trouble, I would choose up and take that. And then they kept the climax. That's about a month and a half to pass the resign. And they didn't have any break. And I taught my Ben Bible class one Lord's Day morning. They didn't have any break and we went home. And I couldn't take it no more. 
And I never will remember, know why I went in the room and locked myself in. I don't know what good that would do. That would keep somebody from getting in, but I could get out. And I stayed there. And directly I got up and I went to the Sunday school superintendent's house. He is there with his feet up in the air and the chair sound asleep and had the big troller running. It was loud enough to hear country mile. I waked him up and I said, Brother Mullen, I've come to tell you, Lord save me. I want to preach next Sunday. Well, he said, it's about time. I'll never forget how let down I was. I thought he ought to shout all over the glory, you know. So <laughs> he said, it's about time. I thought of prick my little bubble a little bit, and I could get up my senses again. I said, well, what do you mean by that? He said, things been going on, but you didn't know about it. He said, before you got here, there's a letter sent by some woman down in Abilene, Texas, named of Mrs. Barnard, addressed to the superintendent of Sunday school, the First Baptist Church. And there was another one addressed to the pastor. She didn't know the name of the Baptist Church. But the letters were identical. He said, that woman said, my boy is coming to teach school said, he's not a Christian. God called him to preach. And he's had an awful rough time. And I want you to build a fire under him. Smoke him out. He said, we met together, and although we knew you weren't saved, we wanted to help the mother, and we elected you to teach a in Bible class. Said we've been meeting once a week. Said Lord, make the fire hot. <laughs> What's your point of rebellion? What's your point of rebellion? God help you if you've got one, drop it. Drop it! Out in West Texas, pastor took me out to have chicken dinner with a young farmer rancher, and after the meal he's showing us about, he's proud of his cattle. In time to leave, I said tonight, I expect you to walk that aisle soon as the invitation starts. Stand up there for that crowd. Say, folks, Jesus Christ is my Lord. He said, preacher, if I did that, it'd kill me. I said, I know. That's exactly all on God's earth it'll cost you to get saved is yourself. yourself. All on earth you need to do to be sure you go to hell is to keep on in a state of rebellion against the Lord Jesus Christ. That's all. That's all. My message is done. My ministry here for you gracious people is done. I'm not at my best preaching among friends. That's the truth. I'm not at my best preaching to where, where we're hemmed in you dear people are. You're gracious people. But I got to meet you at the judgment. And for some days, I haven't assumed that you're Christians, because I don't know. 
I don't want to one of you face me to judgment and say I came to Fairborn, Ohio, and took for granted that I was born again. I don't know. I don't know what makes you tick and what's inside of you. You saved, I can't unsave you, thank God. But I face you one more time and say, please don't go out of this building tonight in any kind of rebellion against the will of the Lord Jesus Christ for you. Don't have anything in your life where you say to God, can't touch it. Lay off. Don't do it. Don't do it. Drop it. If it kills you, drop it. You bow your heads, will you stand to your feet with your head bowed? Close them up. While they get ready for our invitation song, stand there with your head bowed. With all the pathos and passion of my soul, for the last time, we know not what the day will bring. I stand in this pulpit in the stead of your past and in the stead of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I say, young man, young woman, mother, father, husband, wife, reach in your heart and pull out in the rebellion and drop it. Come under the King Jesus Walk this aisle to signify your utter surrender to him who has a right to demand it and demand it right now. Girl, I wouldn't be talking in this solemn hour. Don't do it, please. Let's sing together. Let's sing together. Sing together, are you coming? Drop that rebellion, please do. Come on. Come on. Let's sing. Aren't you going to sing? No, just drop it, just as I am, without one tree. But that thy blood was shed for me. Drop it. Drop it. Pull it out. Don't hold on. Drop it. Drop it right now.